Okay, I will call the 6 p.m. Uh, May 18th special, virtual special West Hartford Town Council meeting to order. Uh, this meeting will be a live, will be live on West Hartford Community Interactive and on Channel 5 Frontier TV 6098, YouTube as well as www.whctv.org. Um, I just want to briefly, many of you have heard this again, but if there are new people tuning in, um, we have uh, new rules with the, our virtual meetings. Um, because in-person attendance of public meetings is likely to increase the risk of transmission of COVID-19, this meeting is being conducted in accordance with the governor, uh, governor Lamont's Executive Order 7B, which permits municipalities to conduct public meetings virtually. Members of the town council and uh, town staff are participating by WebEx, and members of the public can view these meetings, on, as I said, on both Comcast Channel 5 and uh, Frontier Channel 6098 and www.whctv.org. This meeting is also being recorded and is available for on-demand viewing and will be available on the town website. Because of the virtual format, there are special rules and procedures that we need to follow. First, I ask all participants to mute your devices when you are not speaking. If you wish to be recognized, please raise your hand and I will call on you. If you are participating via audio only or I do not call on you and the debate is ending, please make sure you unmute your phone and just say that you would like to speak and I will recognize you. Second, main motions will be made by me. No second is necessary. We will proceed immediately to debate. Um, uh, and uh, and no second merit. We'll proceed to a debate. These include, sorry, motions to adopt, receive, or approve business items. Uh, subsidiary motions will require a second. Uh, the uh, member can be recognized by, take, by just acknowledging a second uh, by unmuting their line. Third, pursuant to Executive Order 7B, all speakers must state their name and their title each time they speak. Fourth, because of the difficulty in tallying votes, we will do votes by uh, voice vote, um, but I don't think there are any in this uh, particular meeting. Um, and then fifth, a reminder that if any participant has a problem with their connections, you should immediately call Jorida Reinheimer, and thank you, Jorida, for always being there for all of us, um, whose phone number you were provided earlier. She will let you uh, she will let you know. We can recess the meeting. She will let me know. I'll recess the meeting uh, while we get you up and running again. And if you can't connect virtually, then we will collect you, connect you in an audio fashion. Um, and uh, with that, we will go to roll call, Madam Clerk, Ms. Lebrell. Did you want to do Pledge of Allegiance? Um, I do. I actually have it next after we okay. vote. Thank you so much, Ms. Blanks. Present. Ms. Cantor. Here. Mr. Davidoff. Here. Ms. Fay. Present. Mr. Gold. Here. Ms. Kerrigan. Councilor Kerrigan here. Mr. Sweeney. Here. Mr. Winograd. Here. And Mr. Williams. Present. Yes, that was my bad. We do Pledge of Allegiance now. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, here's my flag. Um, I will state it, but if you could all stand and um, place your hand over your heart. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag, and to the flag of the United States of America. America. And to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. Shaking hands virtually with Mr. Holt. Thank you so much. I, uh, I, uh, sorry, my printer did some weird stuff. Well, I already texted him. Um, uh, mute Mr. Gold. Thank you. <laughs> um, we will go to communications. Uh, we have one communication. Um, it actually is a little weird. It's a letter uh, from me appointing a special advisory committee on reopening and recovery. And there was some uh, materials on this today, uh, but I'd like to take a minute to explain uh, this sort of in, um, in, in context. Uh, these are unprecedented and difficult times, uh, and I've been inspired by watching our community support each other, pull together, help each other, protect each other. These special advisory committees 
on reopening and recovery, I hope will provide the structure that is needed um, and based on that community spirit of input, collaboration, of resilience and coordination uh, and all the resources that are available in our community. These committees will be a platform and venue for listening to our community members, hearing their needs and helping in responding to these needs or those needs. These, this public health crisis has had a significant and profound impact on everyone. We always have to pay attention to the health indicators, listen to our health care professionals, and while we are taking steps to recover and small steps to reopen and ease restrictions, we always need to do that gut check that again, we are in this health care crisis, this public health crisis. As we are physically separated, the impact of each other on, on each other cannot be more overstated. Our actions impact each other more than ever. It impacts our health, our ability to have opportunities for recreation, for us to be able to support our businesses and to make our community even better. Our actions matter, our connections matter. From the small act of wearing a face covering, my face covering protects you and your face covering protects me. That's how interconnected we now are. I have established these two advisory bipartisan committees to bring together and connect community with elected leaders and with Excuse me, we need to break. Jarita, we will take a five minute break. Cancel. I don't know why. Yeah, I'm trying to figure it out, man. All right, so I don't know where that went. Um, 
went off, but it went, it kept muting. I tried to unmute and I kept muting. I don't, anyway, uh, so it might've been part of this whole, um, anyway, the, I, so I don't know how, how much of, of this I, um, but I'm just gonna just really briefly, again, these are pres unprecedented difficult times. These uh, special advisory committees are going to provide a structure to, um, to provide uh, a, an avenue for the spirit of community input, collaboration, resources, and resilience. Um, again, this is a, uh, we are in an health, a public health crisis, uh, and we need to make sure that we are responding to the needs of our community, um, as well as our businesses. And um, we, I will be appointing these two advisory committees, one on economic workforce recovery, responsible for evaluating the needs of West Hartford's businesses, uh, nonprofits work and workforce as a result of the pandemic. Uh, we will make rec recommendations um, focused on the reopening of the town's economy, allowing businesses and nonprofits to operate in a way that is healthy and safe. This will be chaired by Deputy Mayor Leon Davidoff and uh, also be, have Councillors Gold, Kerrigan, Winograd, and Williams on that committee. Special Advisory Committee on Social and community recovery will be responsible for evaluating quality of life issues, including social needs with regard to physical health, mental well-being, food security, child care and education, quality of life matters and more. It will also be responsible for joint deliberations with the Board of Education to consider the needs of West Hartford school age population. Councillor Lamb Sweetie will chair, Councillor Blanks and Faye will be a part of that committee. I will be ex officio as co-chair on both and in accordance with rules 24 of the standing rules, any councillor may attend the meeting of either special advisory committee and input is welcome. Um, it's critical not only for our community members to feel invested and connected to all recovery efforts, but also to help us engage as, uh, in all resources available to our community. Listening and understanding will be the center of this committee's work. Uh, we will work in collaboration again with the community, elected leaders, and staff. And this is to break down walls, to build opportunity, to build possibility, and, and to make us the best community we can be um, stronger um, on the other side of this journey. Uh, these challenges will bring again the opportunity for us to work collaboratively and cooperating uh, cooperatively. Uh, I, none of this is going to be easy. None of this is set in stone. We are going to have to reinvent ourselves multiple times. A, a few gems will come out of this. There no question, but there will be times where we make mistakes and fall down, and we're going to have to pick ourselves back up. So I want, I, uh, want to say thank you to the, for the commitment of obviously staff for, for doing all that they do every day, uh, for being uh, there for us to, to help um, bring community engagement um, and of course to the elected leaders that are, are, give so much of themselves. Uh, and I hope that this will connect community in a way that will be um, really helpful and bring us uh, to a, a place of taking steps forward uh, that make us stronger every day. Uh, so again, thank you for that. And with the, um, if there's no objection, I move that we receive this letter. I'm looking. Okay, uh, the, matter, the letter is received. And now we will move from the plans of reopening certain recreational facilities, leisure and service programs. Mr. Hart. Thank you, Mayor. Matt Hart, to town manager. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for uh, joining tonight's meeting. A couple of, couple of notes on this. Uh, number one, our leisure services and uh, social services staff in consultation with our municipal recovery group is looking at when would be the most prudent time to reopen uh, certain facilities, such as our outdoor facilities like the tennis and pickleball courts. Uh, we're also looking at uh, interior facilities like the senior center as well. And we would like to bring our thoughts and our plans to the, uh, the recovery and reopening committee uh, for your feedback and your guidance with respect to that. So I, I believe we're going to look to hold 
our first meeting uh, this week, and we'll have some items for you to consider. Um, also, wanted to touch base on the summer programs for leisure services. Uh, hopefully, you all received an email from me on, uh, on Friday evening. I uh, do want to apologize to the council again. Um, I think we, uh, we certainly got a bit uh, ahead of you on some of this. We canceled, we made the decision to cancel some of our summer programs, some of our most popular summer programs. And I realized that we didn't uh, give you much notice or uh, perhaps more importantly, an opportunity to discuss the decision uh, that we made with you. Um, I think staff, staff certainly very well intentioned. You know, they've been working very hard on all of this, um, trying to move forward in a deliberate way, trying to move forward quickly when needed. But that was certainly a conversation we should have had with, with the council. So again, I apologize for that. I, I will take responsibility for that. And we will look to have those conversations with the recovery uh, committees going forward. Uh, that's all I have on that subject right now, Mayor. Happy to take any questions or comments council might have. Thank you, Mr. Hart. I think there will be a, a good opportunity Wednesday, and I think I, I had, I don't know if we got confirmation of time, but I think 6 p.m. Uh, we are going to be uh, having the first of these advisory committee meetings uh, to, to discuss uh, the recreational facilities and leisure services uh, programs. Um, are there any questions for Mr. Hart on this topic? All right, so we can, we will be discussing again this in, in, uh, on Wednesday in that committee meeting. I'm just gonna hold for one minute, make sure that nobody else. Okay. All right, uh, and C on our agenda is plans for May 20th, reopening of restaurants and retail. And I, from what I understand, staff has some information for us. Mr. Hart. Thank you, Mayor. Matt Hart, town manager. Uh, again, thank you all for attending tonight. The main purpose for our discussion on this agenda item, we'd like to talk about our plans to promote outdoor dining and retail as permitted by Governor Lamont's Executive Order 7MM and uh, to solicit to solicit your, your preliminary feedback. Uh, before I go much further, I, I do want to thank and, uh, and commend the mayor for challenging us on this uh, on this topic. I know that this is something she's been passionate about and interested in for some years now in terms of how we can promote more pedestrian activity in town center and other places in town. That's something we were working on actually before uh, COVID-19 hit. Um, I know that other council members, Minority Leader Gold, uh, former members of uh, the Community Planning Committee, Councilor Winograd, and others also share this interest and this passion. In particular, I want to thank the, uh, the mayor for her, for her leadership in challenging us here. Uh, so tonight, we would like to review the executive order. And then secondly, and Corporation Council will take the lead on that. Then we would like to talk about a vision we have for an expanded use of the public right away in order to facilitate outdoor dining and outdoor retail. Uh, third, we'd like to talk a little bit about the local permit process that we've put together. Uh, fourth, the business outreach that we've conducted. Uh, fifth, the budget we would need for this activity. Uh, sixth, I'd like to talk about communication and enforcement, and then get your preliminary feedback and, uh, and answer your questions. I did send a couple of documents uh, just before the meeting for us to refer to. I was going to do um, pretty much uh, almost an entirely oral presentation, but thought that the PowerPoint would be helpful. So to the extent you can, if you have another device, it would, it would be helpful to look at the other documents we sent as well. But for the most part, you should be able to, uh, to follow the conversation. So I would ask Jarida if, if she could, if she could start by uh, loading the PowerPoint document. 
And moving on to the, uh, the second, the, the third slide, th this has very much been a, a team effort, a team effort of staff that has been working on this very hard over the last couple of weeks. Corporation Counsel's Office, Corporation Counselor, uh, Counsel Mr. Dodge, Ms. Verano. We've had a large number of folks from the community development team working on this, Mr. McGovern, Mr. Dumay, Ms. Gorski, Mr. Martin, uh, Mr. Summer, our assistant town engineer, uh, Brian Pudlick, our zoning enforcement officer, as well as Tim McLoche, our, our building, uh, our chief building official. From the health district, Amy Kraus, uh, our director has been very involved, as has Chris Hansen, one of our lead sanitarians. On the public work side, Mr. Phillips, uh, Ms. Nelson from Parking. Public Safety, Chief Riddick, Assistant Chief Coppinger, and Assistant Fire Chief Sinsigali. And last but certainly not least, our Public Information Officer, uh, Renee, Renee McHugh. I do have a number of those folks attending tonight's meeting. Uh, not everyone on this list, but a number of folks who can assist me with, with the presentation tonight. And uh, I'll, I'll be conducting most of the presentation with some assistance from, uh, from Dallas, from Councilor Dodge, who we're going to move to next, as well as Ms. Gorski and uh, Mr. Mr. Martin. And Mayor, I'll, I would now, uh, through you, turn to Councilor Dodge. Thank you, Mr. Council. Hart. Corporation Council, Mr. Dodge. Thank you, Madam Mayor, uh, and thank you, uh, Mr. Hart. I prepared a little bit of a legal primer uh, for everybody tonight on the executive orders, uh, more specifically the executive order that pertains to the expansion of retail and restaurants. Um, and I'm gonna go through a little bit of the history of what the governor's authority is for this and how we got here. Um, at the outset, and first I want to apologize, I didn't have time to make any kind of a uh, formal written presentation for everybody, and so my presentation will be verbal. Um, I want to emphasize at the outset the fluid nature of this. Uh, we're still waiting for the governor to issue the final sort of phase one reopening order, uh, which we anticipate will be executive order number seven uh, PP. And the governor, uh, I anticipate that might actually be issued as early as tonight. Um, and so we will take a look at that as soon as it comes out. And it's probably going to fill in a lot of the blanks in terms of how phase one of this reopening is going to work. Um, I talked about this as a fluid situation. And uh, there's already some aspects of the first phase of the reopening that have changed. In fact, just today, the governor announced that uh, hair salons and barber shops, which had been scheduled, to reopen as part of the first phase uh, on May 20th, that he's going to delay that until June 1st in order to be consistent with some of our surrounding uh, states. As far as the um, restaurants and retail, West Hartford is very fortunate in that I think we are more progressive than many other towns in terms of what we already allow for outdoor dining. And so, a lot of what the governor has done in these executive orders is stuff that, frankly, West Hartford was already doing. And so we're already a little bit ahead of the curve in that regard. I think that there'll be a number of restaurants who uh, are able to who are able to um, operate using existing permitting that they have. So just going back to the beginning, one of the questions that we get frequently is, What's the governor's authority for doing all of this? And it's actually statutory. Uh, it's in uh, section 28-9 of the Connecticut General Statutes, which authorizes the governor when there's a public health and civil preparedness emergency to temporarily suspend or modify uh, state statutes as necessary to meet the public emergency um, and also to protect public health. And so the governor declared his emergency on March 10th, which it's hard to believe was a little bit over two months ago uh, now. And very quickly, we started seeing restrictions on different aspects of the economy. Uh, just to walk through some of the history with regard to restaurants, on March 16th, Governor Lamont issued uh, what's called his takeout only order, 
where he did close restaurants in order that they would only be open for off-premises consumption of food. Uh, he started relaxing those standards eventually uh, on May 19 or on March 19th. The governor allowed restaurants to offer uh, sealed containers of alcohol for off-premises pickup. Um, there were more restrictions on March 29th when he required restaurants to restrict ingress and egress uh, for pickup orders and also to employ touchless payment systems to the extent possible. And then on April 6th, he actually allowed restaurants to deliver uh, sealed containers of alcohol for off-premises con consumption for customers who had ordered delivery. And now there's Executive Order 7MM, which requires municipalities to allow expanded outdoor dining. And, you know, one thing I, I'm sure that many of uh, you have been able to take advantage of some of the takeout options, and I understand that that's been somewhat successful uh, for some restaurants. And I know that there's a desire uh, by, by some restaurants in West Hartford to make sure that uh, as we do expand outdoor dining, uh, I think that we need to make sure that they are still able to offer a successful takeout option. As far as retail, um, the governor on, it was March 20th when the governor ordered all non-essential businesses to reduce their in-person workforce by 100%, which effectively closed uh, all, all non-essential businesses for in-person traffic. Uh, there were some exceptions to that. Obviously, essential businesses such as grocery stores, big box stores, uh, hospitals, that sort of thing. And then eventually he did start loosening that up for some retailers. Uh, and so they're now allowed to offer remote ordering and pickup. Um, and uh, stores are also required to abide by the governor's safe store rules. And so where's all this going? The governor has envisioned, I think, a, a four-phase approach to reopening the economy. And on May 20th, we'll see step one of that, of that approach. Um, he said that he wants to take a gradual reopening approach. And so we will, the, the, the sectors that have been identified for this first phase uh, are presumably the most appropriate to be open right away. And I think in some cases, uh, fulfill certain necessities for the general population. So essential businesses have been allowed to remain open since the beginning of this. That includes manufacturing, construction, real estate, utilities, uh, certain retail, child care, hospitals. Um, and in, in advance of May 20th opening, the governor has issued uh, sector rules, which are basically guidelines for how certain sectors that will be allowed to reopen are going to operate. And that includes restaurants, non-essential retail offices, museums and zoos, uh, university research, and outdoor recreation. And it did include hair and salon services. However, that's now been um, delayed. And we, uh, again, the, the, the rules that have been issued so far, which have been in the form of guidebooks uh, promulgated by the Department of Economic and Community Development, right now it's just guidance. We are waiting for the final uh, executive order to be released by the governor that will govern how these uh, different sectors are going to operate. And so I wanna go over just some of the general rules for business reopening that will apply to all businesses, all non-essential businesses as they reopen. Um, and then I'm going to go over some specific rules that will apply to restaurants and retail, because I, I think there, we need to make sure that we avoid the perception that on you know, Wednesday, it's going to be like flicking a light switch and restaurants are just able to open and operate as normal. Uh, not only are they, are they going to be required to operate outside, but there's also going to be a number of additional restrictions uh, on their operations as well. So all employers going forward are going to need to conduct daily health checks with employees where they will have to ask employees to confirm whether they're experiencing any COVID symptoms. Uh, all non-essential businesses will have a capacity limit of 50% and they're going to need to implement tracking systems to make sure that they maintain that. Uh, they also need to create a plan for re reopening and share that with their employees. And they need to appoint a program administrator who will be accountable for implementing the rules. They also need to institute a training program and ensure employee participation in that training program. And it needs to be provided at no cost to workers. Uh, and they need to provide actually weekly refreshers on that course. Uh, all businesses need to develop 
cleaning plans and checklists to incorporate guidelines on cleaning. And it's the responsibility of employers to make sure that their employees have adequate protective personal equipment. And so um, probably the most common piece of, per of uh, personal protective equipment that employees will need are face coverings. Uh, I, that's distinguished face coverings to masks. All you need is a piece of cloth that covers your face. And employers are required to provide those to employees. And if they do not, then they need to reimburse employees for the reasonable costs and securing that for themselves. Um, businesses are also required to stagger shifts, uh, including lunch breaks and um, other breaks in order to minimize contacts between employees and to install visual social distancing markers throughout the workplace. Uh, <clears throat> they need to make sure that hand sanitizer is available at the entrance and exits of buildings. Uh, also to take steps where reasonably possible to increase ventilation, uh, either by modifying their air systems or opening doors and windows. And there needs to be clear signage that's posted with the new rules. Uh, also, the state is encouraging businesses to install touchless appliances where possible. Um, and businesses will be required to maintain a employee log in order to uh, assist with contact tracing if necessary. And finally, all businesses that reopen uh, as part of this first phase are going to be required to complete a self-certification process with DECD and to receive a reopen CT badge, which they will be able to display online on social media and also in the storefront uh, of the, and also uh, at their physical location. So I now want to get into some of the specific rules that will govern restaurants and retail. And, and again, just emphasize that these are all subject to change. Uh, we are still waiting for the governor's final executive order on this. And you know, I, I know it's a pretty active situation, so I wouldn't be surprised if we saw perhaps some new restrictions put in place or some of these restrictions relaxed. Um, in any event, for restaurants, they are only going to be allowed to offer outdoor seating options. There will be no indoor uh, eating at restaurants. They need to arrange tables to keep six feet distance. Uh, the state is encouraging restaurants to assign servers to specific zones uh, so that there's no overlap and that one server would serve one table. Um, I think that will also help with some of the flow. Uh, there are no buffets allowed and no non-essential amenities, which includes things like playgrounds, dance floors, uh, pool tables and playgrounds. Restaurants need to try and limit shared equipment. So knives, utensils, that type of stuff that perhaps people in the kitchen uh, might share typically. And they're also gonna need to rearrange kitchens to allow six feet distance. And that's something uh, important to note because while we have some restaurants that may be able to operate with expanded outdoor dining under existing permits, if they do rearrange their kitchen at all, they're going to be required to get an additional sign off by the health district uh, on their new kitchen layout. And that's not a, and, and that's not a local rule, that's a state rule. Uh, restaurants will not be allowed to offer reusable menus. I think they're being encouraged to offer electronic menus where possible, um, and also to offer paper, uh, paper menus that can be disposed of afterwards and to use whiteboards and chalkboards and that type of stuff. Uh, for menus. Single-use condiments will be required and restaurants will be required to serve uh, silverware and roll that, that is uh, pre-packaged or rolled. And then for retail, um, again, you know, all of the general business rules apply, but also uh, the state is going to encourage retail, and I think this is something that they've been doing all along, to consider special hours for vulnerable populations such as seniors or perhaps uh, persons who, due to comorbidities, have a higher risk of COVID and if they were to become infected with COVID. Uh, retail needs to use partitions to separate employees with where six feet distance can't be maintained uh, and to rearrange workstations to maintain six feet distance if possible. And again, like restaurants, they can't have any non-essential amenities, which would include self-serve samples, uh, circulars that are being handed out and that sort of thing. And they're also going to be required to close all fitting rooms um, for clothing and, uh, and other items. So Executive Order 7MM, um, what does it do? So basically it suspends local zoning rules to allow expanded outdoor dining and retail. 
Um, and this and this is a municipal mandate that supersedes local restrictions to create expanded options for outdoor activities. How does it define the term outdoor activities? It's defined as outdoor food and beverage service or the outdoor display of goods, which would be the retail option. Um, so what's allowed under Executive Order 7, 7 mm any outdoor activities in, as an accessory use to any location where food or beverages are served or goods are sold or any nearby commercial lot. And so restaurants and retail may be able to partner with neighboring businesses uh, that have commercial uh, that have commercial lots available in order to make some offerings there. Um, it also authorizes outdoor activities on sidewalks and in non-vehicular rights of way. Uh, but with certain restrictions, uh, more specifically, uh, there's a number of restrictions that have to do with uh, ADA access. As an example, they need to include six foot clearance in the pedestrian passage, um, which is important for handicap accessibility, but also obviously to allow pedestrians to maintain uh, appropriate social distance between one another. And all of these are subject to uh, reasonable conditions that may be imposed by the Department of Public Works. And the order is also authorizing um, towns to allow outdoor activities in the vehicular right of way. And again, that's not as of right. Uh, restaurants would need to, or the town would need to get um, the, the local traffic authority, which in our case is the town manager would need to close local roads, but he's allowed to do that without a hearing in this case. Um, and for any state, run, state road, we would need to consult with DOT um, if we were in going to impact state highways, uh, which we do have a few roads in town that are state that, that are state roads, um, or if there was going to be any impact on public transportation routes. So what's not allowed under the executive order? So there's a few things that towns have no discretion over where they can't be more permissive even if they wanted to. Uh, for instance, no outdoor bars, which West Hartford doesn't allow anyway. Uh, but restaurants are not going to be allowed to serve alcohol unless it is served table side and in connection with food service. So restaurants need to serve hot food in connection with alcohol. There will be no outdoor bars under this. Um, also, there's no live entertainment. I think that the concern there is probably that it might become an attractive nuisance, uh, which would draw crowds and make social distancing difficult. And again, as I emphasized before, restaurants cannot authorize amenities such as playgrounds, uh, dance floors, and that type of thing. So what's the approval process for this? Um, fortunately, the governor vested the town administration with the power to authorize permits under this process. And even though it seems very expansive in terms of what restaurants are able to do, our town staff will have a significant amount of discretion in conditions that they can place on different activities. So just because under the executive order, it says restaurants and retail can do one thing, if based on uh, local conditions, something was inappropriate, our local zoning officials would be allowed to put reasonable conditions on any application. So again, all applications need to be administratively approved by zoning staff. There's no public hearing, there's no public notice requirement, no signs need to be put up uh, notifying abutting landowners. Um, of uh, of um, of uh, of any changes that are going to be made, and restaurants and retail will not be required to submit professional plans. So things like architectural and engineering designs. Uh, it's a very simple process where they'll submit basically layperson drawings or illustrations of the area. Uh, they're supposed to try and make it to scale and show uh, everything that's going to be changed. Although our local zoning officials can require restaurants and retail to submit more detailed plans if it's necessary uh, in order to get more information for public health and safety. Um, and they're also gonna be required to provide a narrative explanation explaining any noise, waste management, odor, light pollution, or environmental impacts of the, of the plan. And so our local enforcement officials, which will in our case uh, be our, I believe our building inspection department um, may approve, approve with conditions or reject completely any application that's received. And there is a requirement that decisions must be rendered within 10 days of receipt of the application and failure to approve the application within that time will result in an automatic approval of the application. So there is a fairly tight window uh, to approve these applications. 
As far as limitations, uh, applicants need still need to comply with all the governor's orders and health code. Also, the governor only expen uh, suspended various zoning ordinances and laws and that type of stuff. Uh, there's other state statutes that would still apply to restaurant operations. Uh, as I've mentioned before, law, uh, the local enforcement officer would have broad discretion to impose reasonable conditions on applicants. And there is an appeals process. Uh, it, all appeals would go directly to the Zoning Board of Appeals, and those would be decided without a hearing. In other words, they'd be decided on the papers, and there's no right of appeal uh, to the Superior Court. So all of this is going to be handled uh, locally. And so that, uh, with that, Madam Mayor, that concludes my presentation. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that anybody may have. I'd like to avoid uh, and getting too specific on different hypotheticals, though, because since there's really no body of law that governs this, uh, this is a new process that we're going to be learning as we go along. Uh, I'm going to be, my office is going to be giving legal advice to town staff as different applications come in, and I don't want to box ourselves into any answer uh, on any particular issue. Um, but I am happy to answer any questions uh, to the extent that I can. Thank you, Mr. Dodge. It was, it's clear that in a very short period of time, there's a lot of information uh, and you processed a lot and went through a lot with us. So um, much appreciated. Uh, the question, I just was wondering if you could go over uh, hours of restrictions. I think that was spelled out in the governor's, um, in the governor's executive order as well. And, um, and uh, alcohol uh, consumption. Is that, is that something that's spelled out in the governor's executive order? Yes, Madam Mayor. So alcohol consumption would be allowed if there was an existing liquor permit uh, for a site, but I don't believe that restaurants that don't have a liquor permit or don't have an alcohol license uh, would be allowed to serve alcohol. You do need to have an existing permit. Um, and again, there are no bars that needs to be served in connection, not only in connection with warm food, but it also needs to be served uh, table side. And so there can't be a bar area or a common area where people would go in order to get drinks to bring them back to their table. Um, you know, one example, for instance, uh, you can serve alcohol in connection with food trucks under this, but you would not be able to serve alcohol directly from the food truck because the alcohol does need to be served uh, table side. Um, and forgive me, Madam Mayor, I, there, there was another part to your question, too, which uh, just hours, gave me for a moment. Hour and hour, hours of operation. So. The governor did set minimum hours of operation. Uh, I believe it's nine o'clock on weekdays and 11 o'clock on weekends. However, uh, you know, I am of the opinion that based on local conditions, let's say that there was an, a residential neighborhood that was nearby, uh, which we have a few areas in West Hartford that uh, our local zoning officials, if they felt it was appropriate, could potentially restrict those hours further. But the governor's intent uh, from what we've heard was to establish sort of minimum hours. Uh, towns are allowed to expand those hours. Uh, my recommendation would be, you know, I think as, as we get going with this, that we probably want to be a little bit on the conservative side. Uh, I view the first couple of weeks as almost a pilot program for this. And depending on how successful it was, uh, you know, obviously we'd want to consult with, uh, with our local public safety officials on whether we want to consider expanding uh, hours for restaurants under this new permit. And retail as well, uh, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Dodge. Were there retail hours as well, or is that not um, something that were included in the executive order? Yeah, yes, Madam Mayor, and, and I apologize. I know there's a lot of focus on restaurants, and that's where I think a lot of the attention has been. But uh, when the governor uses the term outdoor activities, uh, he, in Executive Order 7MM, they don't really distinguish between restaurants and retail. They refer to outdoor activities. And so the time for outdoor activities to be open, which would include retail, would be 9 o'clock on weekdays and 11 o'clock on weekends. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Dodge. That's a lot of information. Uh, and I, I uh, appreciate the, the context. It's a, There's a lot of, uh, this is very unusual for West Hartford. We have a robust uh, zoning uh, enforcement, um, and and you know, it's, it's this is a, a bit new a new role for us. So, um, as it is for staff, and that's why communication and coordination is going to be so important um, as we're starting tonight. Uh, so, um, are there questions for Mr. Dodge? And I would. There's going to be a lot of information, so I would say that if if you can keep your questions brief, uh, and then we can circle back at the end of the presentation with more questions, Miss Miss Blanks. 
Ms. Blanks. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, Councilor Carol Blanks through you, Madam Mayor. Quick question for you, um, Mr. Dodge. A point of clarification around the wait staff. I heard you say that they're gonna be restricted to sections. And so I'm wondering, is it gonna be one wait staff per table or would you just expand on that, please? Thank you, Ms. Blanks, Mr. Dodge. Thank you, Councillor Blakes and Planks. Um, so first of all, I want to begin with, we don't have the actual executive order on this issued yet. We've got the guidebooks that the governor's issued, which is written in somewhat informal language. And so this might be subject to change, but I think that uh, the idea is not to have one waiter, you know, waiter only handles one table and that's it. I think what they want is they don't want multiple waiters handling the same table. Uh, and so one, ta one waiter per table, a waiter could handle multiple tables, but they just don't want overlap where there's multiple staff handling uh, multiple tables. And I would imagine that that's an effort to re you know, reduce the potential for disease transmission. Uh, you know, fewer people coming up to tables means that there's fewer opportunities uh, to, uh, for, to, to spread infection if somebody uh, had COVID. Uh, but also it probably makes things a little bit easier in terms of contact tracing and that type of thing. Thank you, Mr. Dodge. Um, Ms. Blanks, okay. Uh, you, other, uh, go, Ms. Blanks, do you have another question? Go ahead, Ms. Blanks. Um, Ms. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Ms. Blanks. <laughs> okay. Uh, any other questions for Mr. Dodge? Okay, Mr. Sweeney. Uh, uh, Dallas, thank you for that presentation. Very helpful. Um, just a quick question on a few few of the details. So, um, this and this may be something that people know more than I. But for weekends, our Friday nights are considered weekend nights, and um, so that would is that is that is that correct, Mr. Sweeney? Thank you, Mr. Sweeney, Mr. Dodge. Uh, I don't have the language right in front of me, but I believe that weekend nights would be considered Friday and Saturday nights. Thank you, Mr. Dodge. Mr. Sweeney. Thank you very much. And then um, uh, and, and you said that uh, we would look, the first week would be kind of a pilot program and we, we, we could potentially, what would be the process to looking to expanding that? Would that be going to the state for uh, an appeal or some sort of process like that? Is that what you're saying? Or we Thank you, Mr. Dodge. Thank you, Mr. Sweeney. Mr. Dodge. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, no, all, all of this is an administrative determination. And so whether we want to keep the hours that the governor's put in place here is a policy determination that will need to be made by uh, the town. It doesn't require legislation on part of the council. In fact, uh, the governor, I think, precludes uh, the council from acting through legislation on that on that particular point. So that'll be an administrative determination. I didn't want to get ahead of the town manager on that. And I apologize if I did. Uh, the town would have the option to allow expanded hours. Um, we wouldn't need to get permission from the state or anything. Uh, that would be an administrative decision that would be made by local uh, building officials. Thank you, Mr. Dodge. Mr. Sweeney, are you? Yeah, just last, there, I assume that there isn't a restriction on when like the morning, rest, like, or morning restaurants can start serving, is that right? No, Sorry, Madam Mayor, I, I gave you the rules and then I break them. Um, <laughs> no, there, uh, th there's no restrictions on uh, morning up on on morning hours of operation. Obviously, you know there are existing rules in terms of when restaurants can start serving liquor and that type of stuff, and uh, that would apply. But there's no restriction on on uh, on the beginning of the day. Thank you, Mr. Dodge. Mr. Sweeney, what's that? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Sweeney. Any, any further? I'm, not, I'm seeing some uh, initials and not pictures for everybody. So I apologize. Mr. Gold. Yes. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, through you. I guess to doubt, uh, uh, Attorney Dodge, um, you talked and touched upon uh, town administration basically authorizing the permits. Is there going to be somebody, uh, and maybe Mr. Hart can address this too, somebody who's designated to make that decision, or is it going to be more of a uh, a collective effort in doing that and my hope also is that when that's done we have uh creativity uh in uh either allowing or not allowing certain things to happen thank you thank you mr gold we'll start with mr dodge 
Thank you, Madam Mayor. And, and I think that uh, the town manager can speak better to how he plans to deploy his staff uh, and delegate authority on this. However, uh, you know, there, there are, even within the executive order, there's certain departments that are going to have to touch uh, different, different applications. For example, if somebody wants to uh, move into the public right of way, either a non vehicular right, uh, right of way, such as a sidewalk or even into the street. That's something where DPW would need to uh, give an approval on that because that's sort of their area of cognizance and that's set forth in the executive order. Uh, for other things, it'll be more the building department that looks at different things. Uh, there's also going to be a role for the health department in this. Uh, I mentioned, you know, as people rearrange kitchens, that's something that the health department needs to look at in terms of. Uh, you know, where are uh, ventilation hoods located? Uh, the fire marshal would need to look at uh, fire safety in connection with that. And so there's any number of town departments that depending on the type and quality of the application might need to look at it. Um, and so it's really gonna be a, a case specific uh, determination in terms of that. But I'll allow the, the town manager to touch on uh, how, how he anticipates uh, deploying his staff to handle these applications. Thank you, Mr. Dodge. Mr. Hart. Thank you, Mayor. Matt Hart, Town Manager. Uh, we'll be talking about our local permit process in some detail a little bit later on. But here in West Hartford, we're planning on a one-stop shopping approach. Applications will come in to planning and zoning. And depending on what's in the application, may need sign off from a building official, fire marshal, and, and others. Uh, but ultimately, our zoning enforcement officer will sign off on all permits. Thank you, Mr. Hart. I know we will have more information on this later in the presentation. Mr. Gold, back to you. Anything further? I'm all set. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gold. Any other questions for the Legal Incorporation Council? Okay, um, Mr. Hart, then I will go back to you on uh, the next uh, part of the presentation. Mr. Hart. Thank you, Mayor. Matt Hart, Town Manager. Uh, thank you very much, Councillor Dodge. Nice job with, with your presentation there. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about the expanded use of the public right away. You know, what, what's our vision? What are we trying to accomplish here? How are we trying to address the uh, the challenge that the mayor the mayor set out for us? You know, our our thinking is how can we put uh, more of the public right of way in play so that our restaurants and our retailers can really maximize uh, this opportunity here. So, what do we mean by public right of way? We're talking about uh, sidewalks. We're talking about some number of on street parking spaces. Uh, we're even talking about a portion of a public street or a public parking lot in, in some instances. For restaurants that are located purely on private property, and we have many, Corbin's Corner, Bishop's Corner, elsewhere in town, if they can obtain permission from their property owner, from their landlord, to utilize more of a, a common area, if you will, and they can safely do that, you know, we, we want to be able to grant a permit for that process too. So, you know, I always hate to toggle back and forth between multiple documents, but we do, uh, we do need to do that briefly here this evening. And I would like to now transition to the slides that I sent you earlier tonight, uh, labeled on-street parking plans. And if uh, Ms. Reinheimer could load those on the screen as well, that would be helpful. So what, what you're going to see, what we're going to present to you now is a conceptual plan for the town center area. And it is just for the town center area. And uh, we modified it as recently as, as this afternoon. It's something we've been working on over the last couple of weeks. Th this model we want to take to our business community, our restaurant community, our retail community later this week, uh, Wednesday actually, to solicit their feedback. But we want to have a chance to share it with you first. 
And uh, we'd like to be able to replicate this to, uh, to some extent in Blueback Square and potentially in other areas of town as well. So if, you're, if you uh, have the slide deck open, you know, the first, the, the first slide just shows the larger town center area. Um, if we could move to the, uh, the next slide, which would focus more, uh, let's focus on Let's look at LaSalle Road in particular. So what we are, what we are contemplating for LaSalle is if we could convert some number of on-street parking spaces, sidewalk, as well as the street, uh, we could certainly enhance uh, seating capacity for many of our restaurants to, to a very significant degree. And you'll see what we're trying to achieve here. We're trying to strike the right balance so that we can provide this additional seating, but also preserve parking for our retailers as well as on-street parking spaces for uh, takeout. Because many restaurants are going to continue to rely on their takeout service, and they're going to want those spaces readily available to them. In order to do this, you'll see that this northern section of LaSalle, under this concept, we would convert to one-way traffic. Convert it to one-way traffic. Um, another change you will note here is that this plan for this section of uh, LaSalle calls for back-end uh, parking. Back-end parking, which is not something we do in West Hartford right now but it's becoming more accepted around the country. It's done locally in the city of New Britain in some areas. And it's, it's safer for cyclists who might be in the roadway as well as pedestrians. Uh, so this, this area would be converted to one-way traffic and we would protect the dining area from the roadway through the installation of concrete and similar barriers. So if you look at that area to the south, in, in front of uh, Brico's, if you will, we could create an area of almost 6,000 square feet and, uh, and add a significant number, uh, significant number of, of seats there. Um, if you move further, if, if we move further up the road, as you can see, we would add another parking area in front of the, uh, the generally in front of the division uh, dining area, excuse me, another dining area in front of uh, Division West, and then uh, across the street in front of uh, Union Kitchen and other establishments on that side of the road. You see how this works, the one-way traffic, the, uh, the back-end parking, and the outdoor dining areas that we would construct. Our, our intention here is that a particular restaurant would take ownership, if you will, of a particular portion of the right of way. And that would be their responsibility. Those would be uh, their tables. We do have some tables we could contribute towards the cause, if you will, but we could not provide the entire supply. The, um, the restaurant tours, the restaurants would be responsible for staffing the tables, properly cleaning the tables, uh, cleaning up trash, etc. We would handle garbage um, and other needed maintenance needs around the perimeter and uh, around the uh, exterior. So that is LaSalle. If, you, if we can transition to the next slide, we will then show you a portion of Farmington Avenue. And this would be the section from the intersection with LaSalle all the way up to South Main Street. And you can see here as well where we've converted some number of on-street parking spaces to potential dining areas. You see something, for example, in front of, uh, in front of Treva, um, in front of Bar Taco, 
and further up the street in front of uh, Max's and, and those restaurants. This is how we would seek to maximize this opportunity for them. Advancing to the next slide, you see a portion of South Main, and this is the portion of South Main that is closest to the intersection of Farmington. You see there some number of parking spaces that we would convert to outdoor dining. Advancing to the next slide, this is an example of the signage we would utilize for the back end parking, which is also known as uh, head out uh, parking, and our parking is, is angled in that LaSalle Road location. This is an example of the signage we would use to notify motorists of uh, how, the, how they should park in those locations. And then the last slide in this particular deck shows various locations for bicycle parking, uh, thinking that some number of folks are going to want to cycle uh, downtown to this area uh, so that they could engage in outdoor dining and outdoor retail as well. So that is an overview of a concept plan just for town center. Again, it, it seeks to strike the right balance between uh, restaurants and, and retail activity, also allowing uh, motorists to safely travel through. I could now turn back to the PowerPoint. I'll give you a moment or two uh, to get back there. And we're going to go to slide number six, and we're going to talk a little bit more about the permit process that uh, Councilor Dodge was talking about. So Councilor Dodge explained, you know, what the state is going to allow, as well as uh, many of the rules around it, understanding that we're still waiting on additional guidance coming from the state. So in terms of our local process, first of all, the, the restaurant or the retailer, they're going to need this self-certification badge from DECD, which they can obtain electronically. At the local level, we want to create a one-stop shopping experience for them, where they can submit their permit application, which is, is quite streamlined compared to many of our permits. They can submit it uh, online, and the entire process is handled in a virtual manner. And we would use a, um, a virtual, excuse me, a, a, a software program that we have utilized right now uh, for other applications in order to accomplish this. We have built a website and I've loaded the link here. When you have time, I would encourage you to check it out. You know, this is a landing page for everyone or anyone looking for information on, one, um, on outdoor dining or uh, outdoor retail. Planning and zoning will receive the application. Every application for a restaurant is going to need to be reviewed by our regional health department. If an application from a restaurant or a retailer, if they're looking to locate in our public right-of-way, on the sidewalk, in the street, in a parking space, they're going to need a sign-off from Public Works. If they are looking to locate a structure, such as a canopy, if you will, they're going to need sign-off from uh, building inspection as well as the fire marshal. But planning and zoning will coordinate and track all of the permits that we receive and provide the ultimate sign-off. We do have some number of restaurants right now, approximately 65, that currently have an outdoor dining permit. They can continue to operate with their existing permit. This is our understanding of the guidance we're receiving from the state, as long as they comply with the state's directives. You know, they're still going to need that badge from DECD, 
they're not going to need an additional local permit from us unless unless they're looking to expand um, the, uh, the scope of their outdoor operation into the right of way, into an adjoining property, what have you. If they're looking to expand what they've been approved for now, they will need this additional local permit, which, again, has, has been streamlined. And someone brand new to uh, outdoor dining, brand new to outdoor retail, will need to go through this process. Advancing to the next slide, Dorita. With, with respect to business outreach, we've engaged in a fair amount of uh, outreach already. I want to commend Ms. Ms. Gorski and Mr. Dumay for their, for their assistance with this. Um, and uh, one thing I forgot to highlight in the previous slide is that for the local permit, no fee. Would not, we would not be, uh, and towns cannot assess a fee for the permit, no fee required for the outdoor dining or outdoor retail. With respect to the business outreach, we've talked to uh, approximately 15 of our restaurateurs. Many of them already engage in outdoor dining. We sent a survey to uh, 113 restaurants. I think approximately 60% of them or so expressed an interest in uh, expanding their footprint. Um, many do not engage in outdoor dining right now, but it's something they would like to explore. We also sent a, uh, another survey to various retailers to gauge their level of interest in doing some business outdoors, understanding that can be more challenging for a retailer as opposed to a restaurant, depending on, on, uh, on their goods and their, their inventory. We are planning, we wanted to share this with you first. We are planning to hold a meeting with our restaurants and our retailers uh, this Wednesday at 10 a.m. You know, to, to solicit their feedback. So that's a little bit about the outreach we've conducted. And uh, when, when I get to the end here, I'd like to ask Ms. Gorski to elaborate a little on the outreach we've conducted to date. Uh, moving to the next slide. Our program budget. So what would it cost if we wanted to expand the use of the public right-of-way in the town center, Blueback Square, and potentially elsewhere in town? This is a preliminary budget and was prepared in a conservative manner, which means it's likely on the high side. With respect to maintenance, we would want to utilize our, our parking services staff, uh, primarily utilize our parking services staff. You probably, Council, you also received an email from me over the weekend uh, with respect to trash we had to deal with in the center. Uh, for about a year and a half now, about a year and a half ago, we instituted a daily trash detail in the center that was performed by our parking services staff. They did an excellent job. We received very, very positive feedback regarding that program. Um, due to the fact that our parking revenues are, are currently so low, we've had to lay off many of those employees, and we've had to reduce the scope of that activity. However, we would plan to bring some number of those folks back so that they could help us maintain this particular area. Again, the restaurants, the retailers would be responsible for a portion of it, but so would the town, particularly around the perimeter, uh, in the streets, on the sidewalks that aren't being utilized by a particular restaurant or retailer. Uh, labor, we would have some labor costs to set this all up, uh, particularly in public works and in police. We would need some assistance from the police to uh, reroute traffic, et cetera, because this would be quite an effort to, to get established. And then the materials component is the most expensive part of the budget. This would consist primarily of concrete and, in some cases, uh, water-filled barriers as well as appropriate signage. So altogether, you know, this is at an approximate cost of $163,000. I 
I did think I might need an additional appropriation from you, uh, but actually learned today that I would not. Uh, we, we are, due to the fact, there, there is some money in the public works budget, due to the fact that we did not have to respond to as many uh, storms this past winter. So we are running uh, something of a surplus in, uh, in public works for the current year. We also have a spending freeze in effect, as you know, when COVID hit. So that is providing some additional dollars that we could devote towards this activity. Assuming it's something you're on board with and something that is welcomed by our restaurants and our retailers. So that's a quick snapshot of the budget. Uh, moving on now to slide nine. I wanted to talk a little bit about communication and enforcement. Communication will continue to be very, very important. We're going to need to continue to talk about our public health restrictions and our protocols. What are we getting at there? Well, physical and social distancing. Yes, you know, we want to see you coming downtown to patronize our restaurants and our retailers, but you cannot forget about the importance of physical and social distancing. Can't forget about the importance of, of face coverings, as well as hand washing, and, and similar public health protocols. So we're gonna to continue to remind people, uh, as well as our business owners, about the importance of complying with these restrictions and, and protocol. When it comes to enforcement, I think we're gonna continue, as we've done already, to take a team approach between the health department, the police department, and our communications team through our public uh, information officer. We're gonna do our best to continue to educate the community. Uh, the police will conduct some patrols when they note a violation. The first thing we always do is issue a warning, a verbal warning. In most cases, we're able to contain, obtain compliance with that. If we have a repeat offender, we may need to issue a citation we have not had to do that as of yet. And we are uh, awaiting additional guidance from the state on how to handle a situation where a restaurant does not comply with state requirements and uh, their permit may need to be revoked, at least in a preliminary way. You know, we're hoping and we do not expect we would encounter that situation. But uh, if we do, we would need to take action. And our understanding is that the health department would be responsible for taking that action. Uh, Mayor, I would now like to turn to uh, Mr. Martin briefly to see if there's anything he'd like to add on the plan. Then through you, I'd like to turn briefly to uh, Ms. Gorski, and then we can open it up for council feedback and your questions. Thank you, Mr. Hart. That was a, a, a really good overview. Um, actually, not such an, an overview. It was a good detail um, and, and, uh, and interesting renderings. Uh, many people are seeing it for the first time, so I know they're processing it. Um, so we, I think we were going to go to uh, Mr. Martin now. Mr. Martin, you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, just to go over a few things, Matt did a great job highlighting the uh, high points of the concept plans. Um, wanted to point out that a lot of the sheets have other information on the peripheral just to pay attention to. At the bottom right on the first sheet there, there's a, a detail of the concrete and the water filled barriers. Those are generally what we're looking at. The concrete doesn't look as nice as in my opinion, but it's, it's more formidable from a public safety standpoint. And those are shown along the outdoor dining areas throughout all the plans. On the top left of each of the sheets, there's a typical section that's shown, uh, and that varies depending on the plan that you're looking at as far as the layout of the travel lanes and the parking and dining areas. Um, on the LaSalle Road sheet, of course, on the bottom left, the, the large area there for the outdoor dining has a lot of detail as far as how you would navigate around the tables. We didn't show that for all of them, but there is a little, um, uh, calculation for the square footage and the number of parking spaces that are used, number of tables and seats. There's a, a table or a spreadsheet that accommodates that information to give a breakdown. The attention was focused on outdoor dining for restaurants, but being cognizant of other uses nearby. Uh, I'd say the, the layout of the outdoor dining expanding into the street 
is uh, best case scenario if everybody bought in and wanted to do it. It's not, we're not saying that you have to do it this way. It can be modified accordingly. Um, the back and angle parking is an interesting concept, which would be a little new. There might be a learning curve to that, but with some uh, education, I think it would be fine. And then just to point out um, on Farmington Ave, obviously we're not looking to do one way there, but we wanted to still take full advantage as best we could of the travel lanes, which are not being heavily used right now. So you'll see that laid out. Um, the angled parking that's shown on those sheets is not shown as back end angle. So if we're gonna do it on LaSalle, we'd have to modify the sheet so that it matches. I would hate to introduce new angled parking and it's different than what we're trying to do on LaSalle. It should be the same. Um, one other thing just to mention regarding LaSalle Road and the one way, there was some thought put into, well, why would we, why would we go northbound and not the other direction? Because it, it's a little counterintuitive because you're on Farmington Ave, it's a busy road. You can just turn on to LaSalle. But the concern there was for uh, traffic could back up if people are trying to park or there's pedestrians crossing or what have you, you could actually back up the traffic into Farmington Ave and we didn't want to do that. And, uh, and then also there, unfortunately, there's going to be some neighborhood cut through. It's kind of difficult to avoid in the type of center that we have, but I think it lessens it if you go northbound compared to southbound. So that's the reason why we were focusing on one way northbound and not southbound in case anybody was curious. And so that's it in a nutshell. If anybody has any questions, I'd be glad to answer. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Martin. Uh, are there, from Ms. Winograd? Mr. Winograd? Sorry. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, through you, uh, just a question um, on the on street uh, restaurants. Will they have an option of building um, platforms? or is, are they restricted to being on, actually on the pavement? Thank you, Mr. Winograd. Mr. Martin? Mr. Martin, I, yeah, I, I don't know. There we go. Can you hear me now? Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know that I'm the best person to answer that. Uh, I, I don't believe, at least from the engineering division, we didn't talk about platforms. I know there was some concern um, and some detail needs to be nailed down as far as making it safe for people who are accessing the sidewalk and the street, you know, because there's a curb there, obviously, you need to navigate that. Uh, but maybe somebody else is more appropriate to answer the platform question directly. Thank, thank you, Mr. Thank you. Mar Martin. Uh, why don't we go to Mr. Hart? Do you have an answer for that? Or can you direct us? Yeah, thank, thank you, Mayor. Matt Hart, Town Manager. Yes, we would. Uh, we would consider that. And that's the type of structure that uh, the building official would need to review as part of the permit application. Thank you, Mr. Hart. Mr. Winograd, back to you. Um, thank you. And just one other question. Um, I can't tell from the maps. Uh, will there be any change in use of the sidewalks? So as they pass by those restaurant areas, are those going to be as open as they are now? Um, or are they somewhat also restricted or used for the um, uh, for tables? Thank you, Mr. Renegade. We'll go to Mr. Hart. Mr. Hart. Uh, Thank you, Mayor. Matt Hart, Town Manager. We may need to reroute the, uh, the sidewalk to pedestrian traffic uh, slightly, depending upon the individual application. Uh, but we will uh, preserve the, uh, the traveled way so that pedestrians can have access, maintain appropriate physical distancing, et cetera. Thank you, Mr. Hart. Mr. Winograd, anything further? Uh, thank you, nothing else. Okay, I think Mr. Davidoff had a question. Mr. Davidoff? Thank you, Madam Mayor. I have several questions. Uh, first, uh, there was a mention of surveys that were sent out to uh, restaurants uh, that already have a permit. I'd like to uh, see if we could get a copy of that uh, email to us so that we could uh, see uh, what the questions that were asked as well as what the responses that were garnered. Um, with respect to uh, public restrooms, uh, patrons, I understand, will not be allowed to access the restaurant, but they're going to have to have a place to uh, sanitize their hands and or uh, use the, uh, the facilities at some point. So is there anything in our plan to 
to address that. Uh, my next one is um, currently we provide 30 minutes of uh, complimentary parking for the takeout. Uh, so how is that going to interconnect with the outdoor dining model with respect to uh, a takeout patron versus an in, uh, outdoor dining patron? And lastly, uh, what steps are we taking to provide either pavement and or sidewalk uh, markings that we're seeing uh, quite accustomed to these days that indicate where the uh, six foot uh, social physical distancing marker is. And uh, the last, I'm sorry, I had, had one other thing. Would the outdoor uh, dining, would the restaurant establishments operate on a reservation system only, or are we going to have people uh, standing around waiting uh, for their tables? So I know we may not know all those answers, but I, I think uh, the restroom question and the parking one, I think we should probably have some answers tonight, hopefully. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Mr. Davidoff. Mr. Hart. Thank you, Mayor. Matt Hart, uh, Town Manager. In uh, response to Deputy Mayor Davidoff's question, uh, when I finish, I would like to ask Ms. Gorski to talk a little bit about the survey and her outreach efforts. Uh, with respect to the restrooms, restaurants are required to utilize their interior restrooms. So they will need to make provisions for that. Uh, they will also need to provide hand sanitizing exterior for the uh, outdoor dining area. But the town uh, right now, we are not planning to locate any, uh, any outdoor uh, temporary restrooms, et cetera. Un under the state's order, the restaurant needs to, to provide that. Uh, you also asked about charges for parking. Uh, right now, we would plan to continue not to charge for the, uh, the takeout parking spaces, as well, at least near term, for the other on-street parking spaces. Now, the parking budget, as, as we discussed a little bit, it's, it's not, we're not seeing much in terms of revenue right now, so we've got to be sensitive to that issue. And I think as business picks up, resume that activity. But in an effort to help promote business, you know, we're not planning to, uh, to, to charge um, near term for the on-street spaces. Another complication we could face there, however, is if we have restaurant employees and others parking in those on-street spaces and uh, camping out in them, if you will, for an extended period of time, that could become problematic because we're going to want to see turnover in uh, in those parking spaces like we're seeing now. They're dedicated for restaurant takeout. They're dedicated for 30 minutes. We're going to have to uh, enforce that. With respect to sidewalk markings, we would uh, we would look to the restaurant to utilize appropriate markings if they're utilizing some of our public right of way and there's a step down, et cetera. The town, we will, we will work with them on that. Uh, we will handle areas under our control as well to make sure that we can comply with the ADA and have all the appropriate markings in place. And then I believe your last question had to do with, uh, with reservations. We think many restaurants will probably move to that model um, with respect to a, uh, a waiting area. They're going to have to come up with a plan uh, for that that would provide appropriate physical distancing. And that is something we will review as part of their plan and make a determination as to whether or not we think it's safe. And then, I'm sorry, I think I, I missed something, Deputy Mayor. You talked about um, deno, uh, proper demarcation uh, for physical and social distancing. We will look to the restaurant to do that, too. You know, what tables would be open, which seats at the table would be open, et cetera. If they're going to be utilizing some of the public right away, we would encourage them to mark off that section of, of the payment, pavement so that they can uh, keep that in mind during their, uh, during their setup for those purposes. So I think that answers most of your questions. 
Uh, Mayor, I would like to turn briefly to Ms. Gorski, and I did note that Councillor Kerrigan has a question as well. Thank you, Mr. Hart. Ms. Gorski. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Good evening. Um, so absolutely happy to uh, share some of the survey results um, and just uh, to preface this conversation. So the um, the concepts that you all have seen tonight that has not been shared with the restaurants. Um, so primarily this was a conversation to gauge uh, what people were doing currently for outdoor uh, dining setups as well as to try and anticipate what they uh, would like to do. Um, and so we sent out two different surveys and um, Todd Zume, my colleague, was a huge help in uh, being able to send out these surveys. Um, so thank you to him. So specifically with the outdoor dining survey, we sent this to 113 eating establishments in town. Out of that 113, we received 44 responses. Um, a couple highlights from that, out of those 44 responses, 75% uh, have existing outdoor dining permits. And then based on that, 60% of those respondents um, said that they would like to reopen with an expanded outdoor dining area. 26% uh, would reopen utilizing the permit with necessary adjustments to comply with the reopen sector. So meaning 50% capacity, six foot uh, table separations. And then 13% said that they had no intention to reopen outdoor dining out of those 44 responses. For restaurants uh, that do not currently have existing outdoor dining area, um, an intent to request a permit to establish a new area, 64% um, of respondents said yes or maybe. And lastly, if restaurants were interested in reopening with expanded outdoor dining area and given the location of the establishment, um, we gave them a choice of expansion. So 32% um, said that they would expand into adjacent sidewalk area, 35% into adjacent parking area or parking lot, 21% into an adjacent public street, 6% into a nearby lot, parcel, or property, and 6% into an adjacent landscape area. Then in addition, um, two other questions that we asked on that survey were to gauge hours of operation. So we asked what their anticipated hours of operation were, um, and that was quite helpful with uh, trying to establish, um, based on the executive order and, and what we could do, hours of operation, just so we understood what the needs were of those restaurants who responded. Um, and then also we asked for what would be an ideal or anticipated seat count um, in order to have outdoor dining. Um, so that was actually quite helpful with our planning as well. And then I also um, would like to touch on the outdoor retail survey as well, um, and then happy to take any questions. Um, so for the outdoor retail survey, that was um, fairly similar. Um, we sent that to 65 retail establishments in town, as well as a variety of different prominent uh, retail property owners and managers. So i.e. Eden's, uh, Blueback Square, uh, Saratage, Regency down in Corbin's Corner, um, the mall. So out of the 65 uh, plus retail establishments that this was sent to, we had 11 responses. Out of those 11 responses, um, we had asked if anyone currently utilizes outdoor space for their sales area, 100% of the respondents said yes. 50% uh, intend to reopen with an expanded outdoor retail sales area. And then if retailers don't currently uh, utilize outdoor space for sales area, um, is your intent to establish one based on the guidelines? And 73% of the re respondents said yes or maybe. And then same question about where um, outdoor retail and, and outdoor commerce, where those retailers would want to expand um, and the type of expansion. 67% said that they wanted to expand into the adjacent sidewalk area, 22% into an adjacent parking area or parking lot, and 11% into an adjacent landscape area. 
So those are the two surveys that we completed. Um, in addition, as was noted in a previous slide, um, there was some one-on-one -on -one, uh, conversations that I did have um, with, it's, it's noted as 15 plus, the plus is in addition to one-on-one -on -one conversations with uh, 15 restaurant tours in town to understand uh, what they're going through, what their needs are, how we can help. Um, I know that uh, my colleague, Todd Dume, he has also uh, had many any conversations with restaurateurs as well as attorneys inquiring about uh, how their clients can utilize outdoor dining based on the regulations. And then in addition, also conversations directly with some uh, property managers as well as general managers. So Blueback Square, a couple of the property managers up in the center, just to hear um, feedback uh, from their tenants and, and specifically um, what they would like to see as property owners, property managers. And uh, with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you, Ms. Gorski. Uh, Ms. Kerrigan? Uh, thank you. Uh, through you, Deputy Mayor. Um, yeah, first of all, I'm, I'm impressed with the, uh, the presentation with respect to the detail for, for the center. Uh, I'm curious if there were any conversations about closing LaSalle in its entirety, as opposed to making it one way, or at least closing it partially, as opposed to making it one way. I'm curious uh, what efforts are being focused on Bishop's uh, Elmwood uh, area, as well as Corbin's Corner. And I'm curious about the amount of parking spots that are there as it relates to the outdoor dining. I assume that there was some formula that was used to be sure that there's ample as well as things like bike rack. But um, overall, I must say I'm, I'm really uh, thrilled. I'm, I'm impressed with the presentation for solving a problem in, on such quick notice. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kerrigan. I'm back, Mr. Davidoff. I, 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 I was trying to look for your raised hand, Ms. Kerrigan, and I couldn't find it and then I couldn't get back on. So I apologize. <laughs> um, so Ms. Ms. Kerrigan, thank you, uh, Mr. Hart. Thank you, Mayor. Matt Hart, Town Manager. Thank you, Councillor Kerrigan, for your question. Uh, with respect to closing off LaSalle in its entirety, we did, or at least a section of it, we did consider that. You know, we thought about closing that, that northern section and recommending against it at this point for a couple of key reasons. The main reason is we want to make sure that the retailers and other businesses are going to have ready access to their buildings, that their customers would have ready access uh, to their establishments, and that they would have some on-street parking uh, to serve to serve them. Typically, when we close a section of LaSalle, as you know, whether it's for the Center Streets uh, program or something else, it's, it's typically for a shorter period of time. We also didn't want to get into a situation where we had a constant uh, setup and, and takedown on either a daily basis, weekly basis, whatever. We would like to come up with a conceptual design that we can set uh, pretty much for the entire season, you know, all the way through the fall, understanding we may need to, to move some things around based upon an individual um, business's needs. But uh, again, we're, we're just trying to, to strike the right balance here uh, access to emergency vehicles is another important component. That's another reason for not closing the road in its entirety. And, and you, you see the, uh, the lots, um, particularly to the west side of that section of LaSalle, they have entryways off of that section and didn't want to negatively impact them either. But it, but it is something we gave a, a great deal of, of thought to. Uh, Mr. Martin could answer your questions related to exact um, exact counts in terms of the number of parking spaces that we would we would lose here, but we do think we would be able to preserve enough of them to support the area businesses. With respect to your questions about other areas of town, you know we have conducted outreach as well to Bishop's Corner and, and Corbin's Corner. And we're inviting them uh, to, to our discussion 
if they're located purely on private property, again, we want to be able to work with them too. If they can get permission from their property owner to utilize a portion of a common area within a shopping plaza, maybe even to utilize a, uh, some number of parking spaces or a sidewalk uh, in, that, in that shopping area, if they can do it safely, if they have their landlord's permission, we will certainly consider that application. There are other areas of town like Elmwood uh, Park Road, for example, where you have restaurants and other businesses that abut a public sidewalk. You know, we will consider applications to utilize a portion of the sidewalk, but we don't have the, uh, the same level of on-street parking and supporting surface parking lots like we do in the center in order to convert um, public on-street spaces in those areas for, uh, for outdoor dining, maybe in some limited circumstances. And we, we will certainly consider something with, with a permit. We want, really want to be able to work with people. So I can't recall, Councilor Kerrigan, if, if you had asked specifically for the number of parking spaces that we would uh, lose in the center area related to this initiative, uh, Mr. Martin can respond to that, that question through Thank you, Mayor. You. Thank you, Mr. Hart. Um, Mr. Martin, why don't you just let us know and then whether Ms. Kierigan has asked her the specific question or not, um, I think we'd all appreciate having the information. Thank you. So again, it's Dwayne Martin, town engineer. Uh, with respect to LaSalle Road, there's approximately 43 parking spaces that would be lost, um, which sounds like a good amount, but the um, under the situation, trying to balance, as Matt said, it's not that bad. We are able, as you can see on the map, um, to convert some of those parallel parking spaces into angled. So that's not a complete loss in that area. Uh, but like I said, I have a spreadsheet in front of me of the parking spaces lost based on the concept plans that we have. So if you have other areas you're interested in, just let me know. Thank you, Mr. Martin. Ms. Kerrigan. Um, thank you through you, uh, Madam Mayor. Um, I just want to uh, express again how uh, thrilled I am that it appears we're ahead of the curve with respect to planning for a semi-opening. Um, and, and it's and impressive, the, these plans. I'm excited to hear what the community, the retail and restaurants have to say. One last comment. I think all of us would agree that New Jersey barriers are ugly, but there may be opportunities for us, if we own the Jersey barriers, to maybe have some painting contests, or you can auction them off. You can own one, and someone can put something on it. But I would, I would just welcome um, an opportunity to have some creativity, so we're not stuck with those ugly Jersey barriers. But but thanks again for all the efforts on all the staff. A great job. Thank you, Ms. Kerrigan. I know Mr. Gold has a question, and Ms. Blanks. And if you have a question, just text me if I don't if I don't see your hand up. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Madam Mayor, um, and through you. Um, I did have a quick question. Uh, was there ever a discussion as we're losing 43 parking spots, uh, Mr. Martin, was there a discussion about maybe lifting some parking restrictions around the surrounding uh, roadways to accommodate that loss, number one? And then a comment, I guess, to Ms. Gorski, um, the, the percentages that you were talking about relative to the retail, uh, you reached out to 65 retailers in town you had 11 responses. So I, I think maybe we should continue to pound the pavement and talk to more real retailers to see and get answers from them. Cause I think 11 is probably not all that indicative of what the, the town truly wants at that point. Um, so th that's my, my two comments. So we'll st actually, we'll start with a uh, Ms. Gorski. I don't know if you want to talk about ongoing uh, communications and uh, feedback and surveys, et cetera. Go ahead. Sure. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, so happy to address that. I agree. Um, you know, 11 out of 65 plus, um, that's that's not great in terms of responses. But in addition, um, uh, inadvertently I'd omitted additional conversations that we have had. So um, I hold a weekly call with um, representatives from each of the business associations as well as the chamber. So we're collaboratively on a call together. Um, so we did speak about this last 
last Thursday. Um, there was representation uh, from several retailers on there. Um, so specific to uh, the center as well as Park Road um, and uh, Elmwood, there was some really good feedback um, about uh, moving forward and would they actually use any sort of outdoor commerce area or not um, specific to the the center obviously um, where we would be doing some modifications to allow for outdoor dining you know does that um, does that help or hurt them um, so there was absolutely some additional um, outreach but I agree continued conversations with not just retails but restaurants um, is the intent. And when you spoke with Blueback. Thank you, uh, thank you I'm, Mr. Gold. I'm sorry, Mayor. Uh, and through you again, I just wanted to follow up with you, Ms. Gorski, until uh, before Mr. Martin answered. Um, when you spoke with Blueback, uh, did they have any indication as to whether or not they were looking at Isham as a potential uh, closure as well, so that there can be some accommodation down in that area as well for that development and such? Thank you, Mr. Gold. Good question, Ms. Gorski. Um, I would defer to Matt and then happy to speak about the business perspective. Thank you, Ms. Gorski. Mr. Hart, would you like to address the issue question? Yes, Mayor. Matt Hart, town manager. Uh, thank you, Councilor Gold, for your question. We did, we were considering uh, closing off a portion of Isham in its entirety. Um, ISHAM is, is actually designed for that, so we were thinking of closing off a section for the season. However, we learned recently that some of the retailers, uh, Barnes & Noble and Crate and & Barrel in particular, would want to preserve some number of on-street spaces to support their businesses. And actually in that section of ISHAM right now, we are down to, uh, to one restaurant that might potentially engage in outdoor dining. So we're going to look to craft a more specific plan for them, as well as some of the other restaurants in Blueback Square, because there are some on Memorial as well. So the, the treatment fee for the center, you know, this, this is uh, designed in part for illustration purposes. We can look to replicate some of this in uh, Blueback Square as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hart. Ms. Gorski? Yes, thank you. Um, so as Matt indicated, um, you know, it's quite important in conversations with Blueback um, that closing down um, Isham right now would really only benefit World of Beer. Um, so the Cheesecake Factory does not anticipate opening outdoor dining until they can open indoor dining. Um, and then it was incredibly important for retailers who find themselves on Isham for them to be able to be open um, and accessible for curbside pickups. So they anticipate specifically Barnes and Noble, Crate and Barrel, they anticipate that a majority of their customers for the foreseeable future, um, although they will be opening um, to customers, their, the majority of their customers will be curbside pickup and they will maintain that strong uh, side of the business. Thank you, Ms. Gorski. Uh, Mr. Uh, actually, we'll go to Mr. Hart first about the on-street parking because a lot's been done. A lot of discussions were, we've done a lot of work on that. Mr. Hart. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Matt Hart, Town Manager. In response to that question, let me start off and then I will ask Mr. Mr. Phillips to elaborate as well. Um, with respect to changing some of the parking, parking restrictions we recently implemented, recall just this past year, we implemented some new restrictions west of center. Our community is still adjusting to those. We'd like to be able to preserve those to the extent possible. We do want to uh, keep some number of on-street spaces in the center dedicated for those quick transactions, you know, the 15 to 30 minutes. Uh, so we didn't want to change the intervals there. We don't think, you know, hopefully we will see volumes of traffic uh, approaching what we what we experienced uh, pre-COVID, but we think it, it's going to be a while to uh, ramp up to that level. So we do anticipate with this plan that we've created, we should be able to support the parking demand. If we cannot, if we cannot, you know, that will be a good problem to have, and we will look to make adjustments. And uh, through you, Mayor, I'd like to ask Mr. Phillips to elaborate. Thank you, Mr. Hart. Mr. Phillips, hi. 
This is your first time speaking to me. Hello. <laughs> Mayor, uh, this is John Phillips, Director of Public Works. Um, yeah, to, to address that in more detail, uh, Matt did a great job explaining it. Again, we do anticipate with uh, restrictions in restaurants as far as occupancy, even as we look forward to phase two, um, the, the restrictions will be uh, both in place outside and interior to maintain social distancing. So we hope we have decent balance between what the demand will be and what uh, on parking, as well as the demand at the retail and um, restaurant establishments. But we do have two parking garages that, that the town owns and operates. And there's also the town center garage um, owned by a private business in the center. Um, there should be parking though, if people want to uh, find it. And we would like to still preserve the um, restrictions we put in the neighborhood um, adjacent to just west of the center. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Phillips. Um, Mr. Gold, back to you. Any further questions or follow up? Sir, you, Mayor Cantor. No, I do not. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gold. Um, Ms. Blanks had a question. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Through you, Councilwoman Carol Anderson Blanks. A uh, great uh, report out from everyone. And thank you, Councilwoman uh, Kerrigan and Councilman Gold, because you asked some of my questions. So I won't repeat it, but I do have a few more. One around the um, uh, traffic flow on LaSalle. So I understand um, some of the concerns around closing it off and the one way. A traffic pattern. My concern and my question is with the one way traffic pattern and the um, thought of the back in and the outdoor dining, uh, just my personal opinion, thinking that there kept, that could be a safety issue, a safety concern. And I'm sure that you all have had many discussions on that. I'm thinking as more establishments begin to open up, we're going to have a little more traffic and that can easily get backed up. So just something for you to think about. Also the handicapped um, parking as well. Wondering if perhaps if any thoughts were um, discussed about perhaps directing traffic into our parking lots and therefore maybe me leaving some of those on street parking to our handicapped parkers. Uh, one, that was one concern and one question. The other question I had was regarding the notice that was sent out informing establishments about the Wednesday meeting. Um, how was that sent out? How were establishments informed that a meeting was going to be uh, held? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Blank. Um, Mr. Hart, we'll start with you. Thank you, Mayor. Matt Hart, Town Manager. Thank you, Councilor Blanks, for your questions. With respect to the one-way traffic pattern and uh, the back-end parking, actually, those are two things that have been endorsed by our, our police because they, they see it as preferable for safety reasons. Again, for pedestrians who might be traveling in, in the, uh, the travel, who might be walking in the traveled way or who might be cycling in the travel traveled way. And they do have Assistant Chief Coppinger on the phone tonight. He can elaborate on, on my response as needed as well. We will make sure that we preserve uh, some amount of accessible parking uh, for persons with disabilities. That's important to us. We're going to try to, to make sure that we can continue to comply with, with the ADA as, as, as much as we, we can here, because that, that's very important for us. Um, we will also provide, make sure that there's appropriate signage directing people to our surface lots. And then with respect to notifications for Wednesday's meeting, I would ask uh, Ms. Gorski to respond to that through you, Mayor. Mayor, actually, I would recommend you go first to AC Coppinger and then to uh, Ms. Ms. Gorski. Thank you, Mr. Hart, Assistant Chief Coppinger. Welcome to you too. Yes, this is uh, Assistant Chief Coppinger. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, sir. All right, excellent. Um, so on, on behalf of the police department uh, and Chief Riddick, we've reviewed these plans and I have to say uh, on uh, 
on behalf of the the engineering department and DPW, the uh, the proposals are excellent. Uh, safety wise, we we approve and we can uh, on the, the police department can support these proposals. And uh, safety wise, we, we have just gone over this over and over and and had discussions. And as they are uh, spelled out for us uh, on these slides and and, and the diagrams. Uh, 100% we can move forward with it. Thank you. Thank you, Assistant Chief Coppinger. appreciate that. Um, so now we will go to Ms. Gorski. Thank you. So the 10 uh, a.m. meeting um, that we will be holding on Wednesday, um, that notification has not gone out yet. The notification will go out first thing in the morning. Um, we were holding plans to share with um, the restaurants and the um, retailers uh, so that we could share it with council first. So now that this has been shared with council, um, we will include that in our notification for um, the meeting notice for Wednesday. Um, and uh, that will go to uh, as many people as possible. So specifically, um, you know, close to, if not a little bit over the, the 200 that we had talked about um, for the uh, survey for the restaurants as well as the retailers. In addition, we'll send that out through the chamber business associations as well as property uh, general managers, property managers, property owners. So we'll try and get as many restaurants as well as retailers as possible. Um, but notification will go out tomorrow morning, first thing. Uh, is, there, is there anything further? Sorry, I'm getting... Uh, anything further? From thank you, Madam Mayor. I have no further questions. Okay, thank you, Ms. Blanks. Um, is there any um, looking for questions? Mr. Williams? Okay. Uh, all right, Mr. Sweeney. Yes, Mr. Sweeney. Yeah, I'm sorry to come circle back. I just had one, one extra question uh, for Chief Coppinger. Um, with uh, the fact that we we don't really know how uh, the public is going to react to the opening of commerce on Wednesday or over the weekend, do we have a, a capacity level for uh, this area? Is there, uh, you know, just to ensure that uh, there's safety uh, being provided? Is there kind of a, a thought process on that? Um, cause, you know, we've seen uh, in other parts of the country uh where some of these restaurants have been kind of uh, overwhelmed by the initial initial uh, uh opening and i just wanted to kind of understand what our protocol is in town and how we're going to do that if if we can thank yes, you thank you mr sweeney mr coppinger this is yes mr. assistant coppinger. chief coppinger uh, so yes, good question. And we have, um, with the schools being closed, we have our, our community relations units, we have our community support unit. Uh, we have plenty of extra officers that we can divert and uh, support the initial phases of getting uh, this program up and running. And uh, there, there are no issues whatsoever as to providing uh, police support for uh, this entire concept. So no no issues whatsoever. Thank you, Assistant Chief Coppinger. Uh, anything further, Mr. Sweeney? No, okay, uh, nothing for Mr. Sweeney. Uh, is there, are there any other questions from counselors? Um, I'm going to, I, Mr. I know Mr. Hart wants to make some wrap up points, but before, and I, I will also, um, but I just, I do want to uh, say thank you all for your, this was very informative, um, a lot, a, a lot of moving parts. And again, like uh, circling back to Mr. Dodge, we still don't have executive orders. Um, and so things might change. Uh, and we have to be uh, understanding that we, you know, we, we might, think that we have all the answers and then things might change and, and we have to be flexible. Um, there has been extraordinary thought that has gone into this and a lot of um, outreach uh, and consideration. Um, a much, I think that, that everybody sort of started with the blank slate 
of closing LaSalle or closing this road or closing that road and, and seeing, and then understanding it's more complex than we, than we think, listening to all the constituents, all the, um, all the, and, um, um, all the people that are affected by it. And it's really, um, it, it's, it, it, I think this is a, 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 looks like a very, very good compromise. Again, health and safety, number one. And we, Mr. Sweeney, to your point, uh, this is something that we're gonna have to keep an eye on. And Assistant Chief, I'm, I'm very um, uh, pleased with your comments and, and actually, you know, your enthusiasm uh, for the fact that so much planning has gone into this and it's been um, in such a, in such a wholesome, you know, a whole holistic look, uh, and and how it is a uh, will affect um, the dynamic of the of safety and the capacity of the police to to be partners in this. So I appreciate that very much. Um, I'm back to you, Mr. Hart, and there might be a couple more comments, but uh, I'm just going to pause for one minute, make sure there are no other counselor comments or questions. Okay, Mr. Hart, to you. Yes, Mayor, Matt Hart, town manager. Just, just a few concluding thoughts, and, and you, Mayor, you made some of the points I wanted to make. You know, this, this is a, a fluid and rapidly developing situation. I really want to commend and thank the staff team for their hard work over the last couple of weeks. You know, what we've done over the last couple of weeks would normally take uh, months here and uh, with, with respect to our processes, so we've managed to compress it within a, a very short period of time and you know that's that's why sometimes you're 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 getting information shortly before a meeting you know we were um changing things uh well well and in, well into today modifying them based on on the latest information and more of that will will continue to to, to come so we need to be flexible in that regard you know we're excited about this opportunity in terms of immediate next steps we're gonna meet with some of the key stakeholders on Wednesday. Uh, we may need to schedule more stakeholder meetings. We certainly wanna do that. The permit, our local permit is up and live right now. You know, we have that dedicated uh, web page. So if someone wants to file a permit today, they can do that. And then our concept plan for the center, will keep you apprised of, of those conversations with those businesses and, uh, and how that goes in order to set up that design, you know, that, that obviously is gonna take a little bit of time um, to, to obtain the materials and uh, properly set them up. But if, if the state gives the go ahead for the end of this week and someone has properly filed their permit, um, we're ready, willing, and able to, uh, to work with them. And then uh, last but certainly not least, uh, again, Mayor, wanted to commend you and other counselors for challenging us, challenging us to take this to, to the next level and to work with our business community so they can take best advantage of, of this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hart. Um, I appreciate all of the, the staff's time. I don't think we, I don't think we heard from Mr. Dumay tonight, but I know this has your imprint all over it and there's been so much input into this. Uh, as well as Chief Priest Mike Sensigali, so much planning uh, and and input, um, Mr. McGovern. You also, I, I know you've you've had a, a major role in this, and I, I appreciate all the work that you've done. And thank you to those we heard from, uh, our town engineer, Mr. Martin, um, our, our DPW director, John Phillips, um, Ms. Gorski for all the work and outreach uh, that you've done. I know Greg Summers on the on the call as well. Thank you for your work. Um, Assistant Chief Coppinger uh, for all of your leadership and, and help with this too. Um, and there are many things that are happening that are, are things that our community is going to benefit from from the long term. And some of them, uh, one of the things that Kristen Gors uh, Ms. Gorski mentioned was the weekly call with all the business associations. I remember when we tried to make this happen and it wasn't so easy to do uh, in the days, pre-pandemic days, uh, where everybody felt that they had a unique uh, interest and it wouldn't be such a good use of time to have those collaborative meetings and sharing those thoughts. And I remember Mr. Sweeney was very, uh, was really excited to have that happen. And that's a wonderful, a wonderful outcome of this, the communication and the collaboration. Um, I also 
uh, know that the stakeholder meetings, engaging with all of the centers, the fact that, you know, hey, you, you didn't get the, the responses, or maybe we didn't get the responses that we wanted, but there's going to be engagement going forward and ongoing engagement going forward. And I think the level of, um, of customer service and, and listening and the appreciation for to our businesses and residents on all that you guys, all that staff does, and actually all that the counselors do, I, I think will be a benefit um, to everyone involved. Um, I also think the permitting streamlining, the permitting process, maybe there's pieces of this uh, that will uh, be helpful in the future. Um, some of it won't be long-term, um, but, but much of it will. Um, but at least the enthusiasm and the breaking down of walls and the discussions uh, and maybe a, a new way of looking at things and problem solving, as Mr. Gold said, creativity is really important. But so is patience and so is understanding and the fact that everything's not going to be perfect um, and everything is not going to be um, as we planned it to be. Uh, and it, this is, you know, this is a really, really hard situation. And um, oh, I see Gina Verano too. A corporation council, Dallas Dodge, and and uh, Gina's office has done a, a really extraordinary job of just responding to so much information coming their way. And I I want to thank none of we we could not have navigated and gotten here again without the understanding of what was coming at us. And so so that's really really important. Uh, and Mr. Hart, thank you for listening. Thank you for taking our charge to heart uh, that we all want to see. Um, as much as we can in always in the in the frame of health and safety of our public. And like I said to actually a muted microphone, <laughs> I said that it's really important um, that we protect each other and our actions have never been more connected with what we do. My wearing a, my wearing a mask affects your health. You wearing a mask affects my health. We are more interconnected than we ever are, than we ever have been. My, and the decisions that all of our community makes is going to make or break whether these, these activities are successful, whether we can participate and expand leisure services in a safe way, whether we can expand social uh, interactions in a safe way. It's going to depend on each and every one of our personal responsibility of whether this is good for our community. And I hope everybody takes that seriously and to heart. We're not trying to in make enforcement behavior, you know, to, but we are going to urge everybody very strongly to respect each and every person. And if you don't, you're, you know, there are gonna be, um, there are gonna be negative consequences. And it might be the fact that we can't continue to offer outside dining or we can't continue certain activities. So I urge everybody to make sure that that's the case. I have talked to some um, businesses that are concerned about certain aspects. I think many of their questions have been answered. I would just again, encourage that engagement and that discussion and that input. Um, and I, I'm very confident that that will happen. Um, and I, I wanna thank, again, I thank all of staff, thank my elected, um, all of you that for really lift, it, this was a heavy lift. Uh, and I think we're, we're in a, an extraordinary place. Um, and I, I'm very appreciative. Uh, and thank you to uh, my elected uh, leaders. I, it's a weird place that we're kind of um, in the back seat uh, this time. Normally we are um, kind of, you know, helping to make uh, some, some decisions, but these decisions can be made without us um, and now. Um, but I think uh, staff is showing that they really want our, our input as well as, as does the public by making the calls and the outreach that they do to each and every one of us. So um, with that, um, Mr. Dodge, I have a quick question for you. Do we have an executive session for counselors? Thank you, Madam Mayor. No, uh, we do not require a uh, executive session. Everybody should have gotten an email from me concerning a piece of uh, pending litigation. And if anybody would like to uh, discuss that, then I'm more than happy to uh, do so individually and on the phone. Thank you. And to our public, um, again, the urge of a personal responsibility, but also engagement and giving us the ideas and the resources that we are going to need. Our community is all gonna have to step forward to bring us through this incredibly challenging journey. And um, so I urge you to uh, participate 
in um, these community outreach advisory committee meetings. Our first will be Wednesday at 6 p.m. And this will involve our leisure services, um, the, a lot of our leisure services activities, including library, senior center, um, pickleball, tennis, and um, camps. So I, again, appreciate um, the, the public's um, uh, interest. Um, but we need your energy and we're all in this together and let's um let's bring west hartford through this stronger than ever so uh, with that i make a motion to adjourn any objections seeing no objections have a have a good night and be well thank you